Welcome you all to our Blue Economy event. So we're going to be talking today about global trends, local challenges and foreign investment. My name is Sean Rees and I'm a, a social scientist and economist and I'm based at the University of Plymouth in the UK. Uh, I lead a, a team of researchers uh, within the University of Plymouth Marine Conservation Research Group and we specialise in linking social and ecological systems. The speakers and panellists today are members of the One Ocean Hub and I'll just take a few minutes to describe the One Ocean Hub to you. Uh, we are a group of um, researchers and we're funded through the UK Research and Innovation Fund through the Global Challenges Research Fund and we're a community of 22 scholars from international universities and research centres from the UK, from South Africa, Ghana, Namibia, Kenya, the South Pacific and the Caribbean. And the hub is led and hosted by the University of Strathclyde, which is based in Glasgow in the UK. And the One Ocean Hub aims to transform our responses to the urgent challenges facing our oceans. Its research seeks to bridge current disconnections in law and science and policy and integrate governance frameworks to balance the multiple ocean uses with conservation. And it strives to empower communities, women and children who are most reliant on the oceans to inform decisions based on multiple values and knowledge systems. Our speakers today are, uh, we have, um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask everyone to give a wave as I say. Um, we have Holly Niner. Um, Holly is a research and knowledge exchange uh, fellow at the University of Plymouth. And then we have a series of presentations on regional experiences of the blue economy. And we have the pleasure to welcome um, Kelly Haru, who is director of the James Michel Blue Economy Research Institute at the University of the Seychelles. We have Jeremy Hills. Uh, Jeremy is professor at the University of the South Pacific. We have Alana Lancaster, a lecturer in international environment and energy law at the University of the West Indies. We have Merle Soman. Merle is an associate professor and head of department of environment and geographical sciences at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And we have Thierry Berger, who is a qualified solicitor and an associate of the International Institute for Environment and Development. And we also welcome two additional panelists who are here to support our speakers, uh, enter the discussion um, and respond to questions. We have Professor Kerry Sink. Uh, Kerry is the principal scientist in the marine program at the South African National Biodiversity Institute and a research associate at Nelson Mandela University. Um, Kerry was a full-time participant in the Ocean Economy Lab in South Africa and the technical lead for Marine Protected Area Expansion Initiative. And we also have Lorenzo Cotula. And Lorenzo, thank you, is a principal researcher in law and sustainable development at the International Institute for Environment and Development. And he leads research and policy work spanning investment law, natural resource, governance and human rights. So we have a, 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 a great array of speakers. Uh, we have much that we want to share with you today. Um, but before we start, uh, we have some housekeeping. Um, all the session today is going to be on auto record um, and we hope to share these via YouTube after the event uh, for anybody who, who couldn't join. So the chat and the Q&A text will be included. And if you do not wish any of your comments to appear, just please let us know, direct message us, email us after the event, immediately after the event, um, and we'll make sure that anything that you consider as sensitive can be removed. As well as the chat function that you've already started to fill up, we've got uh, 50 odd people in the room from all over the world. It's so exciting to see. Um, few familiar faces, lots of new faces. And uh, we also have the Q&A function as well. So what I'd like you to do is to use the chat function just to throw in thoughts, ideas, um, anything that pops into your mind. 
uh, websites that you want to share, great papers that we should share as a group. And then if you have an actual question that you would like to pose one of the panel members, then please use the Q&A function and we'll try and organise ourselves that way to have a bit of free flowing chat conversation. And then if you have a direct question, make sure that you use the Q&A function. So we, we can see who you are, you've entered into the chat, but we also um, have a poll that we would like to run just so we can get to know you a bit further. Um, we, you'll see a poll that will, should pop up on the screen for you. And there are three questions in that poll. There is the question of where you're from. There we go. Uh, what's your experience of the blue economy? And where is your experience of the blue economy? Um, and we're just going to give you a minute to fill that in. Um, and then we will close it and we'll see what our geographical spread is. So we'll give you just a minute to fill that in. Um, and whilst we're doing that, I'll get Holly to get ready to share her screen. Okay, so can everybody see the poll function uh, within at the uh, appearing on their screen? Uh, it would be great if you could tell us exactly where you live. Um, they're very broad areas on there. Experience of the blue economy. Uh, what we would like to know is if you've heard of it, if it's new to you, or if you're actually very embedded in developing the research and analysis around the blue economy. And then where is your experience? So we recognize here that perhaps your blue economy experience is not necessarily in the country where you live. Um, so there's a series of uh, regions here uh, that we'd like you to try and identify with uh, for your blue economy research. So the poll will close in about 20 seconds and then we'll see where you're all from. So we have mostly sub-Saharan African in the room. Uh, I guess this also depends on which areas of the globe are currently awake as well, doesn't it? So yeah, we've got Europe and North America there, which is fabulous. Um, we've got, most people have heard of the blue economy, so that's a good starting point uh, for us. We have plenty of researchers and analysts as well in the audience. Um, luckily, only 2% say it's new to them, so we've just got 2% to, to bring up to speed there, but all of us are, are in the blue economy discussion. And in terms of the experience of our audience, most of our experience is from sub-Saharan African regions, um, which is great because we have um, much to share today about the development of the blue economy in various locations across. So, Thank you all. We will have a good look at those results afterwards and start to think about how it shapes our discussion. But to kick us off, I'll hand over to Holly um, and she'll set the scene for today's webinar. I'll, I'll give a brief introduction to Holly. She is a Knowledge Exchange Fellow and Research Fellow at the University of Plymouth. And she is involved with the Marine Conservation Research Group and is also one of the leaders on the One Ocean Hub programme. So off you go, Holly. Thanks, Sean. I'm just going to double check that that is working and it is great. So um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Holly, as Sean said, um, I'm going to give a very brief introduction here into some of the work I've been looking at, um, along with others, um, into the policy basis for the blue economy. 
and how this begins to shape its form and how it's enacted and, and embedded within society. So the blue economy is the term that's been gaining traction since 2012 and before, um, and it's commonly defined along the lines of the definition displayed here, centered around the triple bottom line of sustainability, where the environment is protected, um, society um, is equal, enhanced and safeguarded and the, and the economy has grown. Um, however, it, it's widely, widely acknowledged that achieving this triple helix of aims is, is challenged um, in practice. Um, and this is also highlight, highlighted or the complexity of, of meeting these triple aims of um, sustainability are highlighted by the complexity of the sustainable, goal, sustainable development goals that have been set under um, Agenda 2030, of which there are 17 covering um, a, a wide remit of, um, of topics and aims. Um, so in recent reviews of the discourse surrounding the blue economy, um, the, the definition um, of the blue economy has been shown to um, vary, vary across purposes, depending on the um, people and the context within, its, um, within which it's being set. So as it currently sits, um, the definition is fluid and it's open to being employed by different people with different priorities. So whilst for many the blue economy represents a, bite, a bright spot, a point of optimism, optimism where the force of economic growth might be balanced or metered or met by those drivers, drivers and efforts for the protection and enhancement of environmental and societal conditions. Um, for others, there are concerns that the blue economy is yet another mode of greenwashing or bluewashing to cover ocean grabbing and furthering of um, unsustainable exploitation of the marine environment. So most fundamentally, um, while blue economy policies and activity are forging forwards, the definition for many um, is still under formation and we're at a critical juncture to examine this and support its oper operationalization. Operationalize, operationalization, yeah, I, have, I struggle with that word too, <laughs> to fit sort of um, definitions of equity and justice. So um, this is a very um, rough, and ready um, uh, uh, word, I'm trying to think of the word, word cloud, um, where I presented some of the results that I've gained from a re review of global blue economy policy. Um, so in summary, um, I found over 30 states with national, um, national level blue economy policies, four regional policies, and numerous um, development programs with aims of furthering uptake and progressing the blue economy as a way to meet the, um, the sustainable development goals and agenda 2030. So, um, and what I plan to do is to, uh, is to take this review and then um, undertake an analysis um, looking at how these aims are interacting with the sustainable development goals. But, um, and we can see here um, where the size of the words is indicative of the number of times they appear in the blue, econ blue economy policy aims that I've identified. Um, the, high, the importance of marine resources as an economic or business opportunity um, with the words environment, whilst the words environment and sustainable are strong, they are matched or smaller than those indicating business or economic aspects such as maritime, ec economic or ec econo economy. And we can see that local community cultural heritage elements of the blue economy, which are things that people feel so strongly is part, is part of the definition, are, are way down the stacking order and, and you really have to search to find them in that um, word cloud. So um, it's worth reminding ourselves that um, the sustainable development goals and kind of aspects of sustainability are, are intrinsically linked. Um, so where for many goals and targets meeting or achieving another is is absolutely essential so in this picture here um we depict the or i've taken it from another study so i didn't depict it at all it's somebody else's picture um where um we can see the co-benefits of achieving sdg 14 and the targets associated with that so for example if we look at um target 14.2 here environment restoration where the target was by 2020 sustainably manage and protect marine and coastal ecosystems to avoid significant adverse impacts. 
Um, we can see this, this supports achievement of poverty reduction, zero hunger, reduced inequality, sustainable cities and communities and, and more. Um, and these then have ripple effects as achieving each of these then supports the achievement of other goals. So the next phase of our study in relation to the blue economy policy aims is to study, examine how different arrangements of the blue economy will interact with the complexity of sustainability in Agenda 2030 and how it might be supporting or undermining these aims. So here we've taken the blue economy aims and developed a typology against which we can undertake this appraisal. Um, we've got 16 aim types. Um, Joe, if you'd like to share the poll now. Um, we were hoping that perhaps with your um, experience of, of those present, um, we'd be interested in, um, in understanding a bit about what, what are the drivers of the blue economy in your experience. And you can pick as many as you want, and we've had to split it in two just because of the limitations of the Zoom polling system. And we'll present these results, results later on. But um, some examples of this typology include the competitive edge, where um, national policies um, state a clear desire for demonstration or leadership in the development of the blue economy. Operational safety, where there are aims to improve the conditions for those working offshore and capabilities of countries to rescue a people and equipment at sea. Marine literacy, which is to promote visibility and societal awareness, understanding connection with marine environments. And climate change, which is less focused on reducing the immediate effects of climate change, but more so on how the blue economy can be developed in a resilient way to withstand the inevitable changes and challenges that we will face in the future. So each of these and the combination um, in which they appear within a policy varies greatly between countries and region and they give a real indication of how the blue economy is being interpreted. So I'm just going to move on to my next slide, but if we keep the poll up, I'll come back to this in case you're not um, finished. Sorry, I'll get my right computer. So in summary, um, the blue economy is diverse, both between and among countries um, and regions. Um, and despite it forging ahead, um, there is disagreement in how it should be enacted and what activities are included or excluded and who undertakes these and who leads these. And there is much to be negotiated in terms of its profession. So we're at a policy window for science, both natural and social, to assist in the development or the definition of the blue economy even, so that it can be operationalized um, effectively and resist misuse and misinterpretation. If we can start to understand the policy aim mix of, of the blue economy and what best would suit the um, aims of a particular country, people, region, um, then understanding what, um, how these mixes interact, then we're more likely to be able to help shape the um, future agenda as it develops. So I will leave, leave you with my typology here. If you'd um, like to just complete that poll, and then if we move back to Sean, then um, I, then um, we can go into the more regional experiences of the blue economy and see how it varies. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Holly. Um, with in the One Ocean Hub, we are we are developing research on critical perspectives of the blue economy, and so we would really welcome your interest. Um, the typology that Holly has just shown please have a crack at the poll and fill it in just so we can start to develop those ideas, uh, develop those connections with you so we can have discussions around how the blue economy is developing uh, in relation to the SDG targets. So in this next part of the webinar we have short presentations from each of our panel members and then a brief reflection on that experience from another panel member. Our first speaker is Kelly, and Kelly is the director of the James Michel Blue Economy Research Institute at the University of the Seychelles. She is currently developing academic resources, networks and knowledge to support the Seychelles Blue Economy agenda. And internationally, she also contributes to research, education and awareness to advance ocean-based sustainable development. So if you 
okay to share your screen with us, Kelly? We'll let you get started. Uh, That's right. it. We got it. Great. Uh, and you can hear me all right? Great. I just put in my headset. Uh, hi, everybody uh, from Seychelles. Um, today, I'll just chat to you a bit about the blue economy in Seychelles. Just to give you an indication of the vast space, um, Seychelles has 115 islands and we have 1.3 million square kilometers of ocean space, EEZ, and about 450 square kilometers of land. Um, so it's, it's a massive amount of ocean, a uh, population of 90, about 95,000 people. And we also have over 300,000 tourists a year. So it's quite a contrast between the two. Uh, major sectors obviously are fisheries and tourism. And we're looking at diversifying into other sectors like aquaculture and, and such. And so we are in the south of Mahe. Um, I just like this image because it gives you a bit of a contrast of, of nature and development. And it helps you also think, a little, well, just relate um, some of the challenges we have in terms of developing sustainable development agendas and the blue economy in terms of capacity. Um, all right, and then um, just, I wanted to reflect here quickly just to, on this, this diagram from WWF on the pillars of the blue economy. I quite like this because it brings us back to, I suppose, what Holly was also mentioning about what the blue economy is looking at, the principles in terms of sustainability, people, planet, and profit, and um, how these initiatives really are at the heart of the blue economy and the complexity of how nations um, operate and the resources that they have really contribute to the challenge of people understanding what the blue economy is um, and the different, I suppose, discourse at the moment. And so just to reflect a bit on Seychelles specifically, uh, Seychelles has developed a blue economy framework and roadmap, and it has been based on three pillars, creating sustainable wealth, sharing prosperity, and securing a healthy, resilient, and productive ocean. And under each of those, there are specific things that they're developing diversification, um, looking at emerging sectors, making sure we have we secure food, food security, education, employment, um, business opportunities, and making sure we protect the climate um, and deal with climate, um, climate issues, climate risk. And um, there's, particular, there's, there's also the cross-cutting and enabling environment, looking at marine spatial planning and research and development and international cooperation and then the governance aspects of that and so that was operationalized i suppose you could say in 2016 and was developed with commonwealth of learning all the way back from 2014 i think and now they're busy working with uh, uneca to develop a blue economy action plan and so when we developed the blue economy roadmap we identified some some key challenges or issues that needed to really be dealt with in order to operationalize the blue economy roadmap and so the action plan is looking how to address some of the challenges that are holding um, the blue economy framework uh, operationalization back also in 2011 the nature conservancy was discussed discussed um debt restructuring our restructuring of our debt, debt obligations uh with um the, uh, the government of seychelles and so as part of that, there was, um, a, well, the, that really a lot of that, so that money then was with the condition that that money was used for ocean conservation and climate change adaptation related. And so as part of that, we, there was also the condition that we developed a marine spatial plan, which protected 30% of our exclusive economic zone. And so Seychelles met that target now in March this year. Um, so, and we, as part of that, we developed the Seychelles Climate uh, Conservation and Climate Adaptation Trust uh, with a, a grant which goes to supporting projects on the ground. Um, and this was quite nice because I think a lot of the time people always think about the roadmap and all the, the policy framework and how things actually um, are developed at the top. But then the trickle down of what happens on the ground is sometimes not always easy to conceptualize. And I, I think, you know, just thinking about the just the role that some like a trust like this has in terms of transparency of um, use of funds to make sure that organizations on the ground are using the money properly and that the money is being spent um, and that 
the organizations and communities are actually being used, um, supported in terms of uh, scientific, um, well, you know, just thinking about, because I think some of the challenges we've had with dispersing funds um, and project ideas is that it's very difficult for people to think about innovative ideas when they don't really know what the blue economy is. And so part of the challenge has really been trying to think about how to support people to come up with some innovative ideas um, and also think about the social and ecological aspects of developing business opportunities. And so the, the, the Blue Grants Fund is great because it has a committee that helps assess different projects and it also helps support so we support communities when they need support in terms of writing for applying for grants um, and that kind of thing and so you'll see that there's different aspects of the blue economy that are met and operationalized on the ground um, that support i suppose a sustainable blue economy um, and then this is just our marine special plan i just wanted to reflect on the complexity of this process and uh, that was supported by the nature conservancy and just looking at the the governance framework um, the zoning, we had various layers of data that went into that, but it's not just about developing the, the plan, it's also about thinking about the costing and the financing, the policy, the governance arrangement, the monitoring and enforcement. And so we've reached the milestone of 30%, um, but now we have to think really about how we operationalize it and how we fund it um, and how we monitor and enforce. And so as part of this, Seychelles is looking at developing the Seychelles Ocean Authority which will have that kind of integrated ocean management, ocean governance aspect where it will bring together, I suppose, different aspects of, um, you know, different sectors um, to manage, to manage uh, what's happening in the ocean space. Uh, all right, and this was quite nice because um, I quite like the, I think often people think about business, but they don't really think about the other aspects of business in terms of the blue economy. So in Seychelles, we're trying to look at how to support uh, business business opportunities through an incubator and trying to see how we can support entrepreneurs to, so that they can work through their ideas and that they can get the mentorship they need to come up with innovative business opportunities linked to the blue economy um, and other obviously. Um, but I, I just wanted to also mention this, I don't know if you can see, if you can see in the bottom this lean canvas and um, environmental, social and governance criteria and thinking about how to support people on the ground who might not necessarily have an environmental background or a social background um, or, you know, even a financial background and, you know, who have to think about developing in a blue economy mindset, you know, trying to think about how we support them in terms of, you know, flow charts or guides to think about how to incorporate aspects of environmental responsibility, social responsibility um, and governance related. Um, into things like this. And so these are things that I'm, you know, we're working through, through things like the group, the Blue Grants Committee and other. Um, all right, and then just the last slide, I mean, this was just to draw your attention to some local initiatives where we're trying to valorize um, local fisheries that are sustainable and local tourism labels where we're trying to support tourism to, to perform more, um, more sustainably and some other things you can look at um, when you have a, a chance to look at the PowerPoint presentation. So that was very quick because I was very mindful of the time. So I hope I got the key points across. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to answer questions when the question, question session comes up. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Uh, the experience uh, with the uh, in the Seychelles, listen to the experience in the Seychelles with the blue economy is, is pretty interesting uh, because uh, from my perspective in the Caribbean, it it it, it appears to be a, a such a, a tangible case study as well as a living experience because uh, I got to one stage the the goal but then it's the the operationalization of the next stage and i think this the, these experiences could be quite interesting uh, and 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 instructive for sm other small island developing states such as those in the caribbean uh the pacific and african regions uh what are your experiences in the pacific jeremy 
Well, I'm going to talk about the Pacific in a few minutes and uh, going to uh, come on to a presentation about that. But I think really they're very different to what's happened in Seychelles. And I think it makes me think about the different stages of maturity of blue economy. And, and I think that's an interesting frame to look at the diversity of talks that we're going to get today. So thank you, Alana. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for Kelly for the, the talk and a couple of brief reflections there. Um, Kelly, you have a couple of questions in the chat that you need to get onto, some specific questions for you. Um, we'll also bring some up at the end if there's too many to, to get through, but if we could try as a panel to, 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 to answer some of those uh, questions as we go. Um, but we'll move on to Jeremy. Um, Jeremy is a professor at the University of the South Pacific. He has worked on oceans and climate change in over 15 countries for UN agencies, development banks, as well as a range of other regional and international entities. Uh, besides working on the One Ocean Hub, he is presently mapping financial flows of development assistance for the Tonga Parliament and mobilisation of the Green Climate Fund in Nauru. He's leading a UNDP multi-sector analysis of the blue economy based around ocean accounts framework in Vietnam, as well as de developing for the World Bank, the first national ocean policy for Fiji. So obviously a very, very busy person, Jeremy, lots going on. And if you're ready to share your screen, uh, it'd be good to have your experience. Great. Thank you very much and uh, hello everyone um, and it's nice just to have a few moments to talk maybe about blue economy and I would like to show you three slides really one about global issues one about local issues to the Pacific where I've been doing quite a lot of work and a third one about the finance and some of the final as financial aspects which will be touched on by others later. You know, I think at a broad global scale, we, we really are at a juncture about what the oceans are for us. You know, we, we can carry on using the, the oceans as a sort of rubbish bin for plastic and other things we don't want, or we can keep them as natural, uh, natural resources and, and havens for biodiversity or, or whatever we want. And I think the picture at the top left from the OECD sort of shows a, a, a exploitative use view of the oceans. We can also think of the oceans of, of the bottom picture there about um, reefs from the Pacific, um, a very different type of ocean. And really, I think the, the, the choices for these days is about how we balance those two different areas. And I think partly that blue economy is, is an investigation into the balance between the exploitative nature and use of the ocean against its inherent values in terms of biodiversity, culture and heritage. And so we hear a lot of global rhetoric in the, in the avenues of the UN and various organisations about um, the blue economy and we've heard that for a decade or over a decade now. But really it's about finding this balance and some, some writers are quite negative about the um, way that sustainability is embedded into the ideas of blue economy. I just will say a very short quote here from a paper by Jacques and Lobo in 2018 in Global Environmental Politics. And they did a review of um, fisheries and aquaculture reports trying to understand what, what was the elements behind sustainability built into, into those areas. And I quote here, we conclude that the norms of sustainability have been selective for fitness with the neoliberal political economic order and a totalizing ideology of growth and that sustainability concepts are used as a mask to legitimize extractive goals that are actually not sustainable. And I think that that's very interesting and it touches on what Halley mentioned earlier on about there is still this challenge about the blue economy and about the articulation of the blue economy, what it really means and where this balance is between 
exploitation, extraction, the resource economics of the ocean, and about the preservation and maintenance and intergenerational equality of a whole variety of different aspects of the ocean. Um, so that's the global thing. Let's move down more to the Pacific. Let's think about the people of the Pacific. And in a way, I, I'd like to talk about this, this way that this global dialogue feeds back into the, into the Pacific. A, a recent review we've carried out with Oxfam in the Pacific under the Raising um, Pacific Voices um, program of the EU, talk to people about the blue economy. And one of the questions that was very noticeable is about, have you ever heard of the blue economy? And the majority of the people, the coastal users, that you're, the sort of people you're looking at here from the Solomon Islands, from the countries that were surveyed in the Solomons, uh, Micronesia and Tuvalu, had never heard of the blue economy. So they were active in the blue economy as we see it, but it wasn't a relevant point of contact for them in their place-based sort of reality of the blue economy that they were involved with. So the rhetoric from the global corridors has never reached down to, to these people in, in the Pacific, in the islands that we're looking at. And we also have to recognize that there probably are different priorities that don't fit so comfortably with this economics or a, a set maybe a traditional view of economics. Within the Pacific, the um, biocultural aspects are very important. The aspects related to connectiveness of people and of connectedness, connectedness of people to the, to the sea, to the land and to the sky. You, we are the ocean is a common thing that people say in the Pacific. And there's much greater degree of connectiveness between these things. And when you consider that the majority of the inshore fishing people are partly or mainly subsistence in their livelihoods, then where does economy come into that? So this connectedness is all important and also this, this sense of place. They have a very strong sense of place which links to their perceptions of the world around them. And blue economy really hasn't found its way in to, into that sort of understanding that the people have. And in a way, that's why blue economy, to the extent that we've heard about in it penetrating down to, to local people in the Seychelles, has not really happened in the Pacific, in my, in my particular view. The third slide here is talking about finance. And here we've got um, the amount of number of projects up, up the y-axis along the sustainable development goals SDG 14 and the targets there so we've got SDG 14.1 on the left to SDG 14.C on the right. The left graph shows the voluntary commitments coming from the Oceans Conference and these are largely government-led and you'll see that those um, commitments were, from the government were largely across the whole array of SDG 14. The graph on the right shows a much, much narrower positioning of investment um, with, around certain areas, particularly SDG 14.2, which is about uh, marine conservation and protection. And so development assistance is landing within the Pacific region in a different array to what the government is expressing. And in particular, when we talk about economic aspects, we look at SDG 14.7, which is economic benefits to SIDS, small island developing states. We can see in the voluntary commitments coming from the government that that is the second highest of the commitments that they've made for carrying out projects and initiatives. Whereas in the development finance, that is one of the smaller areas of development finance that's coming into the Pacific. And this is tracking about 855 million of development finance coming in. So it's quite a substantial portion going over 12 Pacific Island um, small developing countries. So what's happening here um, is an interesting differential between the, the blue economy as perceived, maybe the development as perceived by the government and the development assistance coming in the area. 
So at the moment, I think there's a somewhat of a degree of indecision about blue economy and how it manifests itself in the different place-based sense of the Pacific. And the Blue Pacific is moving partly down this, this idea of reclamation, reclaiming its rights to various resources that have been uh, maybe extracted through colonialization over the years. And the Blue Pacific is a, a policy that has been set out by leaders within the region. And how blue economy interacts with that reclamation of the Pacific and of the resources of the Pacific will be very interesting to play out and what role the, the blue economy will play in that. So I think it's a much more of an open question about the blue economy and particularly the blue economy for whom? Who is benefiting from this inertia behind the blue economy at the global level, which really is not manifested in the people that maybe need blue support the most within the Pacific. So I'll leave my uh, little talk there. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, very interesting. After my talk, I think it's, it's a nice contrast um, to look at what's happening on the ground. And I think your point about, um, you know, just reclaiming rights and then also how people reflected on the fact that they didn't really know what the blue economy was and thinking about how emerging sectors will benefit people across all the states that form part of the Pacific and how these discussions will take place and how things will translate from the top down um, and how the consideration of um, you know, history and culture and activities that have been happening for a very, very long time uh, will feed into the development of this dialogue um, and the development of these frameworks. And how it will be managed across the region will be very interesting to see. Um, in terms of that engagement. And I think it's quite complex and probably, um, well, you have Romelana, but probably quite similar in the Caribbean in terms of the complexity of developing uh, regional blue economy frameworks and trying to figure out how that, how that actually operationalizes on the ground, particularly when there's such a strong cultural um, attachment to the ocean and it's so important for, for people's, you know, just, just well-being and their lives and, you know, they've built their lives on the ocean. So, um, it's a different, it's, it's, it feels a little bit more emotional, like there's a, there's, you know, I was felt, felt like a little bit more kind of like business, like this is how we do things. Uh, yours is much more, it feels more, you know, you just, you can get the sense of, of that personal um, connection and how serious it is when you start having these discussions and how complicated it can be when there's so many players um, that are discussing something that's so emotional for people. Mm. I, I agree. I love that phrase, we are the ocean. I'm going to have that I'm going to take it. Um, so thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, Kelly, um, for um, the speak, uh, the talk, and uh, the reflections on that across the different regions. Our next speaker is uh, Alana Lancaster. Alana is a former director of the EPA and has taught at the University of Guyana before joining the University of the West Indies. Uh, Alana specialises in international, regional, and comparative law with a particular focus on ocean governance, marine and environmental law. The law relating to blue economy, wildlife and fisheries and forestry, crime, biodiversity, law and human rights and environmental law. The long list of law specialisms there, Alana. So um, if you're happy to share your screen, um, please do go ahead. And I just would also just like to remind people if uh, you'd like to reflect on anything, please just bring it up in the chat and also make sure that if you have any specific questions, stick them into the Q&A and um, we'll try and get to those as we move through today. So, you ready to go, Alana? Yeah, so you've seen my screen? Yep, gotcha. Okay, so uh, today as I, I'll, I'll basically be presenting on the emergence the emerging opportunities and challenges within uh, the blue economy in Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean region, uh, as opposed to the wider Caribbean uh, as a whole. Uh, one of the reasons I chose Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean is because uh, for many uh, development interventions and so on, uh, uh, the Barbados is linked to 
they, they're managed as a unit. And also uh, within the wider context of the Caribbean, uh, these are a group of, of geographically close and more similar states. So they are also uh, potential linkages for uh, development of the blue economy at a, not only a national level, but at a regional level. Uh, just by for, um, to kind of introduce and give set a context, uh, the OECS is a, a, a economic and geopolitical union. Uh, it's um, constructed by a, a, a constituting treaty, and it consists of 11 member states, nine of which are full members, and are also members of a larger um, grouping called the CARICOM community, the Caribbean community, sorry, of which Barbados is a member. So Barbados is not a member of the OECS, but it is a member of CARICOM, which is a, the larger Caribbean grouping. Uh, all, of, all states are small island states, but they may be considered large ocean states because their exclusive economic zones far uh, uh, outstrip their, uh, t their territory. So for example, uh, Barbados's exclusive economic zone is 388 times that of its 166 um, square kilometers. Uh, the OECS, for example, has a combined ease to land ratio of 85 to 1. And sorry, I should, I should mention uh, in the map uh, to the right of the screen, the OECS are a uh, stretch from where you see my, I, I don't know if you've seen my cursor, but it stretches from the top going down to the bottom with Grenada there. Uh, the green territories are the, the full members of the OECS, they're independent countries. The yellow territories are either overseas departments of either France or the United Kingdom. So that would be Anguilla, BVI, uh, Martinique, and Guadeloupe. And they, are, they have a, what we call associate membership. And Barbados is to the uh, east of the chain there. Um, the ocean economy employs about 30% of the labor force. And they we're talking about just over 1.6, 1.7 million people um, within this, this, these islands. Um, as a concept, the formal blue economy concept entered the lexicon of the Caribbean in 2018. But historically, uh, you know, it, it has been, even from the times of the indigenous and early settlers, uh, there has been a link uh, as I imagine with any island state, to the ocean. However, one of the things I, I do note, uh, the, 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 the difference in connection, I, 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 or I, I, I forgot the word Jeremy said, with, between the Caribbean and the Pacific, which I noticed it, in the Pacific, it does seem to literally be part of the DNA. Uh, the main industries uh, in the Caribbean are uh, tourism, shipping and fisheries and uh, tourism being the main source. And one of the reasons the, uh, the, the emphasis on the blue economy has emerged is because of uh, the focus on the large ocean nature and to address economic and environmental issues and by extension, uh, social issues such as poverty, uh, gender marginalization, and so on. Now, th these countries are, are generally heavily indebted to nature, and most of their expenditure is spent to purchase fossil fuels. Uh, so it, it, this here shows you some of the existing uses of the, or the established industries uh, in the blue economy, as well as some of the emerging uses. And one key emerging use uh, link coming off of my last point is uh, looking for indigenous sources of energy. And uh, in this respect, uh, ocean renewable energy, uh, as well as uh, offshore wind energy are very important uh, potential priorities for the, the, the Caribbean region. Uh, so I've, here I have uh, compiled some 
uh, a combination of, I guess, initiatives, both at the regional and national level. Uh, and I will go through them briefly. And of course, you feel free to, to um, contact me if you want uh, further information. So we've had uh, studies done at the international level, for example, the World Bank uh, report. Uh, we've had regional reports, the, the CDB uh, report of 2018. Uh, 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 as I said, uh, one of the the um, one of the documents that would have started a a, a serious, uh, I suppose, dialogue. Uh, but many countries uh, in the in the OECS and also Barbados have been quietly doing, uh, or maybe not so quietly doing, uh, making uh, moves. So, for example, uh, Grenada has done a, a coastal master plan. Uh, I know Dominica has done a, a blue economy scoping study, and I, I, I assume that other OECS states will uh, uh, also follow suit. And on the regional level, the OECS has a Eastern Caribbean regional policy. And again, this is linked to the, the uh, instrument that sets up the OECS. It's very similar in some respects to how the, 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 the instrument that sets up the European Union and some things are, are managed from a, a, what you call an organizational perspective, while some re, re, remain in the remit of the, um, of, of the individual states. But uh, it, in terms of a, there's a regional policy, there's also a regional, um, regional uh, uh, ocean scape project that is ongoing. Uh, with respect to Barbados, Barbados uh, in 2018 would have uh, been one of the first countries in the Caribbean region to dedicate uh, or, or, or have a ministry whose uh, mandate includes the blue economy and the UNDP uh, accelerator program has started last August, uh, an accelerator lab in Barbados for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, and we, we uh, uh, in 2019, there's also been the second annual conference dealing with blue economy. And this is annexed to a, con uh, a conference, a regional meeting of, of persons dealing with renewable energy. So uh, what are some of the, the opportunities? Well, uh, the regional policy is still very much in development. So we're perhaps at the uh, nascent stage. Uh, and I think this gives us an opportunity to develop a policy that is robust and, and, and embe embedded in a framework that will get, uh, that will enable states to derive the assets, be it direct outputs, carbon absorption, trade and transportation, or the use of, of or assets related to their productive coastline. However, one of, uh, as small island developing states, investment is one uh, of, of uh, and I'll go to the challenges, sorry, will be one of the challenges, but the, 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 states can explore innovative investment. And, and, and in many respects, uh, we're, we're, I suppose, looking to some of the experiences in the Seychelles in this regard. All right, so what are some of the challenges I have identified? Uh, the need for more research and data that can inform the areas of priority in the blue, in the blue economy. Uh, financing and investment, uh, business environment. Um, the Caribbean has a very, uh, ranks very low in the ease of doing business index. The need for supportive policies, um, institutions, legal and re regulatory frameworks. Uh, uh, the, 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 basically, what do we, our marine or ocean literacy is, is, is something that could be enhanced uh, one of the key aspects, uh, and, and maybe this is where the OECS will be, uh, could be used as a, 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 a good model, is 
uh, regional cooperation and regional and international cooperation. And within the OECS structure, you, uh, there's potential for both regional cooperation between uh, the OECS members as well as other CARICOM states. But because of the, the overseas departments like Martinique and, and Anguilla, also international cooperation with other countries, uh, with other developed countries. Uh, inclusiveness and gender factors is another important one because uh, generally in, in, in many, let's take fishing for example, fishing is a profession that uh, there are many fisher women, but they're marginalized and things, simple examples, trying to get uh, loans, for example, to expand their business. Uh, and adv advocacy, participation, and literacy. Um, in, in concluding, uh, the, the, basically the connection uh, is not between the ocean and, and deriving benefits from the um, activities is not new to Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. However, the resource is largely untapped or the models of utilizing the resource are, 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 are based on models that, that, that focus on, on what, one dimension, which is obviously unsustainable as well. And also, what I did not mention before, we're in the middle of Atlantic hurricane belt. And therefore, uh, living with natural disasters is a reality for us. Uh, nevertheless, there are opportunities. Uh, these present countries with diverse opportunities, not only to diversify their economies, but also explore uh, cooperation um, and ben to benefit from global and regional trends. And I, I, see, I, I see many of the challenges as, as, as things that we can turn into positives uh, uh, to, to make this a really tangible trend for the region. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Adana, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, um, I think you said that the blue economy is a recently emerging concept in the Caribbean region and that regional policy still in development, uh, investment is needed. Uh, what I will uh, say in, a in my presentation in a few minutes is that uh, in the meantime, we have seen that there is already an increase in the ocean related economic activities uh, across the world and so uh, while certain states or regions may be still debating what uh, blue economy means and how their policies will be developed, the impacts of blue economy activities uh, may already be there and will probably increase, and at least as far as uh, foreign investment is concerned. And I will touch on that a little bit in during that presentation in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you both. I think as well, Alana, is the challenge of developing a blue economy across multiple, multiple governance frameworks and um, lots, of, lots of small islands. So again, to the group, please add your thoughts to the chat function. We've got some really beautiful conversations going on there. Um, and then if you have any, any questions directly to the, the panellists or the general theme that you'd like to discuss at the end, please add that to the Q and A function and we'll, we'll bring that broader discussion in. So I'd like to welcome our next speaker. Uh, it's Merle Salmon and Merle is an Associate Professor and the Head of the Department of Environment and Geographical Sciences at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Her background is in the field of integrated coastal management and governance with a strong research focus on seeking new ways to balance the interests and rights of small-scale fishing communities with conservation imperatives and pressure to, to grow the blue economy. So we've got your screen, Mel, and you, you're good to go. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. And um, what I hope to do is just share some perspectives on South Africa's Blue Economy Initiative and draw on the work that we, that's our UCT team, Jackie, Palile, Wayne, and Rachel, who I've listed below here, that we're engaged in through our involvement in the One Ocean Hub. I'll just make a few opening comments. Um, 
Sorry, it doesn't seem to be moving. Use the arrows. It, it yeah, I'm trying that, but it's not. Hmm. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. I, I thought I'd just start by referring to the typology that Sean and um, Holly have put forward. And to say that um, in terms of South Africa's Blue Economy Initiative, I think certainly on paper, there is alignment um, with many of those aims. Um, although addressing climate change certainly seems to be absent. But I think it's fair to say that South Africa has never fully embraced the original United Nations vision of the blue economy. And that is a marine-based economic development that leads to improved human well-being and social equity, but at the same time safeguarding our environment. And the, if we look at the original overriding goal, that was to deliver fast socioeconomic benefits and address issues such as poverty, unemployment, and inequality, which certainly in the context of South Africa was very much on point. But increasingly we see its focus has been on mega projects, fast results, foreign investment, and aggressive economic growth and job creation. And what we've witnessed is the privatization of the commons, corporate expansion by multinationals. And if we just have a look at um, this map here, we see that already at the start of Operation Pakisa in 2014, 98% of our EEZ was under lease for petroleum exploration and other activities. And there was limited attention given to externalities. So I think this approach, very much like some of the comments Jeremy has made, raises questions about who is really benefiting how are the benefits distribute, distributed? And what are the costs to local communities? And I think critically, are their voices heard in these decision-making processes? We're also seeing a softening of environmental assessment procedures and also in some of the licensing protocols. And so this raises questions about what are the costs to the environment? And are we upholding our international commitments to things like the Paris Agreement, the Biodiversity Convention, and even to things like the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. And increasingly, we're reading uh, about protests, about objections. We're involved ourselves in appeals and various campaigns against Operation Pakisa proposals, as you can see here, um, linked to this particular um, proposal for the drilling of gas and oil along the KwaZulu-Natal coast. So I think it's important that we look behind the lofty rhetoric of the blue economy and we drill down at some of the implementation practices and processes and we ask some hard questions about what is the nature of public participation and to what extent are we involving and hearing from people who potentially are going to be affected. If we look on the left at this map, we see that so many of the activities um, are going to take place at that coastal interface where many coastal communities um, are located and depend to a large extent on marine resources for their lives and livelihoods. So we really do need to look at the impacts of these proposals and these projects on lives and livelihoods of coastal communities. And I think we need to ask some hard questions about the extent to which our Blue Economy Initiative aligns with the South African constitutional principles and our National Environmental Management Framework Act. So I want to turn now to process, some process and substan some substantive concerns. And firstly, just a general comment and based also on our team's experience is the lack of access to information on various plans, on concessions, and on the status of various environmental and or planning and or approvals processes. Sometimes we've had to revert to um, what we call PIA, which is um, submitting an access to information request to get this information. We're also concerned that the environmental assessment processes are inadequate. In South Africa, EIA is a legislative tool, 
But this is not always appropriate for the kind of mega projects that we are dealing with in the ocean space. The impacts of many of these ocean-based projects are unknown. If we look at something like seismic activity in the ocean and the impacts of marine mammals, we know that many researchers are telling us that there's a significant gap in our knowledge on this. And in that regard, we are obliged in, term, in terms of NEMA, our Environmental Act, to adopt a precautionary approach. I think we also need to rethink the tools for environmental and social assessment in this ocean arena. I mean, some of the tools like strategic environmental assessment, social assessment, and also um, cumulative impact assessment certainly may be more useful in that they take a more holistic and integrated approach, but also seek to ascertain what are the environmental and social justice constraints in particular areas um, with a view to finding preferred alternatives, which could then be followed up with more detailed place-based environmental assessment or social impact assessment tools. So I think critically, um, our tools must be tailored to fit the kinds of plans and projects that are being proposed. Another concern is that the Department of Mineral Resources is granting a number of these environmental authorizations, um, even though the appeals on some of these decisions are directed at the Environmental Department, we see the Environmental uh, Affairs Department is very much under pressure to support economic growth. And we've seen very few um, appeals being um, overturned, or appeals being supported rather, and approvals being overturned. I want to just focus on a particular case, the Langaban Saldana Lagoon area um, on the west coast of South Africa, which I think highlights some of the contradictions, some of these conflicts, and also some of the vulnerabilities that local communities face. So on the one hand, this is a, a focused area for Operation Pakisa. There's an expansion of the, on the industrial development zone in the northern area of this lagoon area. Um, currently, there is iron ore and steel industries and commercial fishing, but there are proposals now for oil and gas um, for infrastructure development. This area has also been identified as a new aquaculture development zone with the intention to extend and expand mariculture threefold in this lagoon system. Yet, if we turn to the south and if you look at the slides or the photos, you will see the beautiful flowers and the lagoon area, which is what the southern portion of this lagoon area looks like. This is a national park. It's also a Ramsar site. And this entire area is very popular tourist destination and a very important recreational area. It is equally very important to local traditional fishers who have fished here for generations. And so we find a number of very deep contradictions just in this one area and increasing conflicts across the sectors and deep concerns amongst these local fisher folk and other soci civil society groupings regarding the expansion, in particular at the moment, the big attention is on mariculture, mariculture and how it might encroach into fishing grounds, affect water quality, and for many people, the aesthetic value of the area. And so despite objections, despite an appeals process, approval has been granted to proceed with the expansion of mariculture and declare the area an aquaculture development zone, and so civil society is now considering um, challenging this through legal action. And this is one of several cases in South Africa where people are now turning to the courts to assist in upholding rights and um, safeguarding the environment. I know I've been quite critical um, of South Africa's approach to Operation Pakisa, but there have certainly been some wins for marine protection and the, de the declaration of an additional 20 marine protected areas um, is something that has been achieved. But according to Kiri, and she, Kiri Sink, and she's in the audience and very happy to take um, questions, she has indicated that this was not without a battle and that initially amongst some of the key players in these laboratories when a lot of the plans were being generated there was a feeling that this group had no 
relevance in the Sustainable Oceans Economy Lab. We've also seen publishing of Marine Spatial Planning Act, which of course holds a lot of promise. And there have been other developments, for example, in the development of a coastal information system, which is very useful, and initiatives to raise awareness and build um, capacity in, in the sort of marine ecosystem arena. But I think what's very important to know is that, or to note, is that marine protected areas are only one tool for safeguarding marine ecosystems and habitats. I mean, critically, we need to be mainstreaming environmental protection and social justice principles into the planning and decision-making processes. And I think this really requires us in academia, uh, researchers, civil society, to be requiring the revisiting of our assessment tools and procedures and the decision criteria that we're using. I think it's also critical that we um, that we encourage and push for an ocean governance framework that needs to be de developed collaboratively across all sectors, including civil society partners, and that this ocean framework needs to be underpinned by constitutional principles, which ultimately seeks to balance environmental rights and socioeconomic needs and ensure procedural, distributive and restorative justice in planning and decision making in South Africa which is just so critical to, um, South, to, to a country like South Africa, given our historic past. Thanks very much. That's great, Mel. Thank you. I was just wondering if you'd like to provide some reflections on that, Kerry, from, um, your, from your perspective of um, the development of the blue economy. Thanks, Sean. Uh, yes, that, that was a, a good reminder of a, of a very stressful period in my life. Um, when South Africa started off its blue economy work, it was a very interesting social process where for six weeks, the, the invited participants were, were basically enclosed in a hotel for six weeks, six days of the week, in these very intense discussions and, and plans. And this big fast results methodology um, is something that I, I've got quite mixed feelings about because it really provided a platform to take some of the work I'd been involved in for a long time towards implementation. Um, but where you didn't have that substantial grounding, that big, fast approach can, can be very challenging. So, so listening to Merle, I, I was really um, agreeing with her on, on the importance of strengthening our tools. Um, and I agree with what Jeremy said about the need for balance and the challenge of achieving balance. That's really what much of this comes down to. And, and I think we really need innovation in approaches for, for achieving these kind of balances and for bringing in stakeholder perspectives at multiple scales. Something that we wrestle with is, um, and I've had experiences of kind of the difference from engaging oil and gas executives who are you know, top down, 22 sectors very well organized through to fine scale, local scale engagement on the ground. Um, which is so difficult to do at a national level. So I can't help reflecting on, on the value of having multi and transdisciplinary approaches, the kind of relationships we're nurturing through the One Ocean Hub and how this might help us take this forward. So thank you. Thank you both. It's, it's great to have that example of how a concerted drive towards the blue economy is throwing up all these issues around equity and social justice. And the discussion which has also been raised in the Q&A in the chat around how we start to develop um, better decision support tools that, that bring in these more nuanced um, details of cultural links um, and fairness about how we use the ocean. So I look forward to that discussion at the end. 
Uh, as I've said earlier, um, please do keep those thoughts coming on the chat and the Q&A. There's some really, really interesting side discussions going on as we go. Um, and we have our final speaker, who is uh, Thierry Berger. And Thierry is a qualified solicitor and an associate at the International Institute for Environment and Development, where his work focuses on law and sustainable development. Prior to his collaboration with the IIED, Thierry worked for global law firms for 10 years and specializes in international arbitration. So welcome. And if you're ready to share your screen, then yeah, we can see that. That's great, you're good to go. Thank you for the uh, introduction, Shan. Uh, so I'm going to talk about investment law and the uh, blue economy. As uh, Shan said, I am an associate at IIED. Just very briefly, IIED is a policy and action research organization working to promote sustainable development. And uh, my colleague Lorenzo Cotula and I recently published a briefing note on blue economy, uh, why we should talk about investment law, and you can see that on, on the slide. So these are the three things I'm going to talk about very briefly today. New openings for ocean route economic activities, the increasing relevance of international investment law, and the tensions between legal arrangements, protecting foreign investment law, and um, the law of the sea regime. Starting with the new openings for ocean related economic activities, uh, the rising global demand for resources, technological developments, and decreasing available land space have accelerated efforts to open up ocean resources to commercial activities. And as Alana said, uh, this includes well-established sectors such as shipping, port infrastructure, fisheries, aquaculture, coastal tourism, offshore oil and gas, but also emerging activities such as offshore wind and deep seabed mining. So these sectors are of course relevant to, the, um, to many of the um, uh, countries and regions we've just discussed uh, over the past uh, hour or so, including the Seychelles for tourism, fisheries, Ghana fisheries, South Africa, oil and gas, and Mel mentioned who's just now, and the Caribbean that includes uh, tourism and also oil and gas. So these uh, trends have created hopes for new economic opportunities, but they have also led to concerns about ocean resource grabbing and its impact on the environment, human rights and coastal communities' livelihoods. And again, Mel touched uh, on, on those for South Africa and Jeremy also showed, shared with us contract, contracted, uh, contrasted pictures in this presentation. So, Investment law is increasingly relevant to the blue economy. Uh, there are legal arrangements that govern the admission and treatment of foreign investment, which are called International Investment Law, IIL. Uh, international Investment Law consists mainly of investment treaties and broader trade agreements that comprise investment chapters. They protect foreign investments against unfair treatment by the host state and allow multinationals to bring disputes to universal state arbitral tribunals rather than domestic courts. The idea behind this arrangement is that uh, by reassuring foreign investors that they will reap the benefits of their activities, these protections will promote investment. That's the idea, but the evidence that they do so in practice is actually inconclusive. So there's been a rise in the arbitrations connected to sea related activities and since the late uh, 80s, our research has shown that investors that in initiated at least 56 publicly known arbitrations based on investment treaties in connection with sea related activities. And of these, uh, 29 were filed in the past five years. And most relate to offshore drilling, port infrastructure, fishing rights, and tourism. So, policy initiatives, uh, which we described just now um, in the previous presentations, some of them uh, to attract more foreign investments. They will increase the relevance of international investment law to ocean related act economic activities. So I will now briefly mention the tensions between international investment law and the law of the sea regime. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, is the most comprehensive binding instrument for the law of the sea and provides a global 
framework that regulates all sea related activities and close in particular create a special legal regime for the exploration and exploitation of mineral resources in a seabed beyond the limit of national jurisdiction, that's what's called the, the area. Uh, mineral resources in the area are called a uh, common heritage of mankind and benefits from the exploitation must be shared equally among states according to UNCLOS. So depending on circumstances, both UNCLOS and international investment law could have bearing on ocean related activities. For instance, for uh, mineral and petrol extraction, UNCLOS rules will determine the area that lies within the state national, national jurisdiction, such as in South Africa. In this area, public authorities can award concessions for, oil and, uh, for offshore oil and gas projects and deep sea bed mining. Uh, meanwhile, that state investment treaties will protect foreign investments made by nationals of other parties, including in extractive sectors. Uh, but the fact that both UNCLOS and international investment law could have a bearing on ocean related activities could create tensions between the two regimes. And that's because UNCLOS, uh, on the one hand, carefully balances economic and environmental considerations, but on the other hand, international investment law is mainly about the protection of commercial interests. And so measures to protect the environment and the vulnerable communities could be severely challenged by foreign investors due to their impact on commercial returns. Um, so policymakers should carefully consider the governance arrangements of the blue economy, given the implications this can have for the environment and for people in coastal areas and beyond. So these are uh, our email addresses and that's a link to uh, the briefing, policy briefing that uh, we prepared on blue economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thierry, for that uh, really uh, interesting look into the maybe somewhat murky world of foreign direct investment into oceans, particularly in the uh, uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, I think it it's, gives us another direction to really look at blue economy. And I talked somewhat about development finance that has come into the, into the Pacific region. And in a way that opens up the opportunities for further direct investment coming in through, the, through these areas where, again, there may be tensions and considerations for local populations or for the protection of uh, conservation features. And particularly, I think a good example there may be in renewable energy where, where development assessment has opened up the arena for direct investment from foreign investors into development of renewable energy. And so I think this is another dimension maybe that people don't think about blue economy. You tend to look at the down the road stuff, what happens in blue economy and the, the users and the benefits and the consequences of blue economy. But actually within any development on an economic sense, looking at the investments and cleaning up the investments and ensuring there's no tensions between those different regimes may be an important way to to manage this situation and achieve balance that uh, maybe that this session has really identified that is necessary. So thank you for illuminating all us on the uh, FDI implications in blue economy. And uh, I think that's a really interesting component into what we've all been talking about, particularly in relation to this balance that blue economy is, is trying to steer. So, so thank you, Thierry, for that. And back over to Sean. Thank you both. Yes, it's definitely a, a new angle that um, I've, I've never discovered before. So it's, it's, I'm glad that you've been able to share it here with the group. So uh, we have come to the end of all of our presentations. And if you remember back at the beginning, uh, Holly asked you to fill out uh, your um, blue economy typology. So I'm just wondering if Joe, if you can share the results of that. Uh, and the question that we asked was, in your location of experience, what are the multiple aims of the blue economy? So we recognize here that there are multiple drivers of the blue economy, but um, some of them are playing out more strongly than others. And here we have an overriding economic interest uh, from the blue economy. Uh, and 
as we move down, it is towards, so just check on the other ones are over 75 cents. No, attracting investment and the blue economy. So it's really the story that Alana was also speaking to uh, around how uh, investment and blue economy is, uh, is, is a form of uh, development. We also have that there's an interest in environmental protection, which is part of it, um, international cooperation and competitive edge. edge. So we can see all these different components starting to play out and we would, or well, Holly and I would encourage you to please do get in touch with us as we develop the Blue Economy and SDGs uh, paper uh, that Holly is leading and we would really like to start to explore how these different experiences of Blue Economy are playing out um, and the stories that we've heard today lead us on to uh, Q&A for our panel of which they've all been busy beavering away in the background answering some of the questions that come through but there's some really interesting areas that I think I, I'd like to explore further with you and there was a particular question to Kelly about examples of how tourism is contributing to the sustainable blue economy in the Seychelles um, and I'd like to hear from Kelly but also uh, if anyone any of our other panelists would like to share experiences of how tourism is wrapped up in this blue economy development? You'd like me to elaborate a little bit. Um, all right, so I think we generally, Socials has had a sun, sea and sand, long history of sustainable tourism. It's a high end destination. Um, and I think some of the challenge now is that a lot of the high-end tourist establishments are starting to worry that by opening up um, the market, you might compromise the quality of the tourism, the tourist experience. And so there's a little bit of conflict, I think, between the development of the blue economy and kind of, you know, making, um, you know, providing a lot of opportunity for, for um, more tourists to come to Seychelles and have a a uh, kind of budget holiday and the issue with that also obviously is that the usually uh the tourists who spend less don't spend a lot when they come into the country and a lot of the stuff that um a lot of those are package holidays that get bought out of the country and so some of those issues then um you know translate i suppose to um more bang for your buck i suppose um and so yeah and then um so and then there was also a moratorium on large scale hotels. And so they were trying to have less hotels linked to, you know, obviously financial leakage and other issues um, and provide more opportunities for local, um, local establishments. And so what they were trying to do through the sustainable tourism label, the SSTL, was come up with a local labor labeling project, which um, really where we, where the tourism department goes around and tries to have a set of criteria that hotels follow to make sure um, you know, they get rated because I think the international labels can be quite expensive for them. So we were trying to come up with a homegrown version. Um, so you'll see the link in my presentation to that. Um, and then there was that carrying capacity study. We were trying to see um, if tourists, uh, tourists were willing to pay a levy. Um, and so that was part of also what we were doing. And we also have a lot of stuff linked to CSR um, in terms of, um, you know, kind of um, things that are attractive in terms of environmental preservation, education programs where we do marine education and awareness linked to hotels. So there's a lot of NGOs that work within hotels and provide experiences to tourists in terms of um, coral. Um, and we've got some coral snorkeling trails and that kind of thing also to try and look at some other things. There's a whole lot more and I could go on for a long time, but I should probably stop because I'm sure other people want to chat too. Any of our other panelists would like to just share any experiences of sustainable blue economy and tourism, please feel free to share. I think Alana, you mentioned it as a driver for the Caribbean. Uh, it will definitely be a driver for the Caribbean because uh, I, I, in my estimation, our current model is not sustainable. Uh, for many reasons, and it's primarily um, uh, based on cruise tourism, and we've had a, a lot of issues with that. Uh, I'll put it in the chat, but uh, there was uh, 
infographic done on the impact of COVID-19 on tourism and most of the countries that are heaviest affected uh, will be from the Caribbean region. Uh, and we, uh, unlike one of the differences with, in terms of what Kelly said, we are still um, going ahead and building huge hotels that are not necessarily going to be based on um, a more sustainable model. So there's kind of a disconnect. Uh, I, I, it could well be that um, the current, uh, the positive, I suppose, of, of the COVID-19 situation, and we're supposed to have a more active than usual hurricane season. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to talk about, you know, there will be impacts uh, if you don't pursue a sustainable agenda. But I, I think uh, many of us in the last two months have, have experienced a lot. Because we have in Barbados, for example, a significant proportion of the workforce is now unemployed. And even, even now that the country has begun operations again, and many of them will not, these persons will not uh, be able to uh, resume uh, work. And, and even for, for example, in fisheries and farming. So one of the things that UNDP, and I, I'll fin wrap up on this point, in, in Barbados in the Eastern Caribbean is doing, uh, we, we, you know, uh, is, is promoting the link between uh, the digital economy, for example, and, and blue economy uh, in terms of fishing and, and, and coastal farming and so on, because uh, food security and getting markets has become of an issue um, in recent months. I think Jeremy wanted to hop in there as well. I think Jeremy wanted to. Yeah, um, just um, in terms of blue economy in Fiji, um, yeah, it, tourism is a very important part of the economy and most, most of the tourism is related to the, to the coast and people coming for holidays on the coast. Most of the hotels are on the coast. So it really is quite significant um, and it supports not just the hotel industry, but a lot of the flights coming in from Australia, particularly, um, are related to, to tourism and activities associated with tourism. There are good sides to it. And I think, for example, shark diving is quite valuable. I think the figure I've got just at the top of my mind a few years ago was 43 million per annum for shark diving, which is for the, the people that take in the guides and the divers and all that sort of stuff. So it's quite a consistent earner. A lot of people come to Fiji to visit Fiji for the shark diving. So these are relatively sustainable and um, positive um, aspects of it. But also we, we look at the type of economy that's developed. It's very much of um, foreign investment coming in in large hotel chains. One of the, maybe the, the uh, strongest hotels there is the Shangri-La, and that's an international chain. Coming and people come largely stay within the hotels, have an experience with a little bit of Pacific culture, maybe in a fairly diluted sense, um, and then go away again. So they're not community-based um, type activities. These hotels tend to use the villages from the area as people so staff in the hotels, but the ownership and the maybe the flow of a majority of the profit is very, very little to, to the people around. Oh. And there's very little, I guess, development of more community-based activities um, in the area. So tourism's good, it gives jobs to many, and, and the COVID-19 impact has been quite devastating, both on the airline that flies the people in, and also on the tourist industry and the, the lack of tourists that are coming. Um, but it is very much of a foreign investment um, into a very stylized type um, tourism um, activity in Fiji. And, and maybe there is room for much broader and diverse type activities that involve much more community-based areas. But within the National Development Plan, there's certainly a push to develop tourism because it's important in terms of the, uh, the money that flows in through tourist receipts. So thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. 
Um, there was another question in the chat. I don't know if you mind me picking up or a couple that relate to um, the the most sustainable industries or um, and one of them that's frequently mentioned is aquaculture and, um, and uh, renewable energy. Um, but something I think that gets missed on it, I don't think I'm well placed to answer the question as to what is the most sustainable industry that's perhaps captured by the blue economy, because I'm not sure it's been actually defining that kind of um, the net within which the blue economy sits is quite, is quite challenging. Um, but something that's um, interesting to me, and I know it's been mentioned in the chat, is, is the idea of um, digitalization being key for many sort of aspects of the blue economy. Um, I know, um, I'm just wondering particularly, I suppose, for Jeremy, whether, whether you feel this is something that's relevant at all for sort of um, people on the ground, sort of the way it's been acted with, with people that you've spoken to in relation to the blue economy, or whether it purely is at the, bu the business end. Well, yeah, I think digitization and innovation is, is very significant, but um, I think uh, we can look maybe at innovation, not just being technical innovation. I think there's many other innovations that we can think of. Socio-cultural innovation is very important as well to create activity and lifestyle. You know, I published a, a paper recently on, on renewable energy implementation in a village in, in Fiji on an island. Um, and in, in this village, we looked at the impact of renewable energy and it actually increased the amount of fossil fuels that they used because everyone got fridges and their renewable energy ran out. So they needed to then get generators to burn petrol to keep the fridges on. Uh, and they all got um, TVs to watch. Um, and so they didn't tend to congregate around the church and other areas communally. They tend to stay at home and watch the TVs. So the, the impacts in terms of resilience were quite significant to renew, renewable energy, but it increased emissions and it also led to lower resilience and a loss of connectedness across the community, which will have impacts in extreme events and cycling events. So um, yes, there is many, I think, innovations to come in, in the blue economy and we can, we can look toward that. Um, we have to remember many people don't have electricity or access to electricity or many signals and things like that. So we can't digitize maybe the most marginalized and the poorest. And it's very difficult to identify the skills that they would need for that. Um, thinking about the university, so the University of the South Pacific covers about 30 million square kilometers of ocean. Um, and when COVID-19 came along, because it's had to have a history of trying to push the idea of digitalization of its lectures to connect all the communities across the um, very sort of far-flung Pacific, it, it managed to get on its feet and start, start its lecturing activities much better than maybe many campuses that exist around a set of buildings in a well-developed city in, in the West. So there are, um, I think, resiliences and benefits that the economy could really exploit. Um, but I think it needs, like, like Kelly has, has mentioned, some support to the people that would do that to help them find those, explore those, and see what is possible for the blue economy. And I think, really, when we think about the blue economy for the environment, it's not thinking about the, the least um, impactful economic activity that we could do for the blue economy. I think it's about a diversity of activities for a diversity of people, all of which maybe have some negative impacts, but overall are well within the carrying capacity of the environment and the, also the cultural barriers and difficulties that, that, that there are. And I think it's that, that myriad of opportunities and myriad of um, using those opportunities are what make really a strong and vibrant blue economy as opposed to a rather extractive, fast get to the money type blue economy that maybe Merle has pointed, painted a picture of. So diversity and resilience, I think, are things that could be built in and digitization maybe is one component of that for certain activities. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. That, somebody has already asked a, a similar question and I think you have provided an answer for that. They asked, are there any flagship examples of highly profitable blue industries 
that are deemed the most sustainable, either a broad example of an industry or a specific place where that industry has been successfully implemented. Um, this is Jessica, uh, Jessica Glass. She says, if, you had, if she had to guess, it would be the wind hydropower sectors or multi-trophic aquaculture. And she's interested in this from a business and private sector led perspective rather than the top down government perspective. So Jeremy, you just talked about having a, a, a good mix of, of different options, but I'm interested from perhaps some of the other um, panelists if there are examples of blue economy industries that are, are considered potentially successful, but also sustainable. Maybe I can make a comment. <laughs> um, I think that's quite a tricky one because, because of the complexity of the blue economy and the frameworks and how they were developed in each country. And I think to think about an industry as a whole, whether it's sustainable or not, can be quite, um, quite a challenging thing to think about because there are a lot of aspects of each industry, I'm sure, which impact the environment in one way or another, even renewable energy and the impact uh, you know, to birds or ecosystems in terms of the development and that kind of thing. And so I think in terms of how we, um, you know, how we think about and conceptualize the blue economy, we need to think about all those aspects of, of, as Jeremy was saying, bringing a whole lot of things together that work for a country and thinking about the overall direction that you want to go in developing that blue economy framework and trying to minimize those impacts. Um, and like the aquaculture sector, like looking at, um, you know, circular material flows, uh, multi-trophic aquaculture, that kind of thing, using technology, um, combining renewable energy with aquaculture farms um, and the whole kind of system of operation really trying to think about how to make that whole thing sustainable, not just um, from one sector, but combining sectors is quite important too. And I think as we think innovatively about how to combine different sectors and how to bring in circular material flows and how to think out of the box, um, things and industries become more sustainable. But the whole point of the blue economy, I think, is trying to think across sectors and to bridge this, um, you know, this kind of um, silo effect that's happening and causing the issues in the first place. Thank you. Um, I saw a, a, another question from Daya, um, where um, they've asked, what would be the priority areas of intervention, intervention for the blue economy to play? an instrumental role towards building back better within the post-COVID-19 recovery context? Well, it's a challenging um, question again. You guys, uh, guys are asking big questions here. <laughs> I think that uh, for uh, priority in interventions, um, from my perspective, I think it would be interesting and, um, and important to recognize, you know, you know what just what we've shown from from our presentations here that um the blue economy isn't set in stone in terms of activity that's already taking place in traditional ways of working i think it's um it's good to recognize that we're at a point of opportunity to kind of change dialogues and sort of expectations within what economy an economy and a blue economy what that can mean um in terms of uh, other interventions, I'm, I'm just wondering if anyone else has any suggestions, perhaps more practical, maybe legal, Alana, Jerry, <laughs> any others? Because <laughs> I'm sure there are many. For me, I'd like to harness the conversation, I think, and just change that dialogue. Um, I, I'd be happy just to put in a comment there. I mean, I think it's interesting, again, we're talking on priority interventions uh, for the blue economy. But I think, you know, one of the things we, you know, certainly, again, I'm talking from our own perspective, is I think critically important is the framework and the processes that we are working within. You know, how do we, how do we think about um, blue economy initiatives and, um, for, you know, to serve um, coastal communities, for example. And, you know, if, we, if we're going to have industry involved, if we're going to have private sector players involved, how do we structure those partnerships? How do we get these different players to be working collaboratively in a way 
that you know we get benefits to flow where they're mostly needed. So I do think it's uh, the process issues become really important, and the framing and the sort of the you know the the kind of the the mindset uh, around how we perhaps rethink the blue economy um, from a fast results big. Uh, um, mega project kind of approach to perhaps something that's much more nuanced and 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 focused at the local level and perhaps building up from the bottom. I think. Yeah, I think oh, sorry, Shandra. Sorry, Holly. That question also came up. Um, I know that um, it was answered in the chat, but it was to do with. Uh, conflict resolution tools uh, that may be available or decision support tools that may be available from that legal perspective um, that any of our panelists might like to see uh, developed further um, or um, I guess unpicked and packed back together again in order to, su to support a more equitable uh, blue economy which also speaks to those aspects of social justice as well. I think, Mel, you already picked up on things like EIAs um, and SEAs. And do you have anything else that you would uh, that you would add to that as tools that we could look towards to, to break into to, to make them more targeted to developing a fair blue economy? Uh I think uh, a part. Well, I, I, I yes, EIAs and SEAs are 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 tools, but the, the basis, uh, I think, comes down to uh, 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 advocacy, I suppose, uh, uh, and, and uh, um, participatory, the ability to participate, and maybe not ability to participate, because many states do now have uh, mechanisms, be it through legislation or whatever have you, but meaningful participation. Uh, I think it needs to be um, approached on, on two levels. One, uh, greater awareness, literacy, advocacy uh, from the, 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 the ground up, as well as uh, mechanisms which uh, would bring about more meaningful part participation. So not, you know, you do an EIA and, yeah, you publish it in the the you publish the requirements as the, the legislation says, but the community that will most likely be affected or the 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 the, sec, the stakeholders may not have meaningfully participated because they're 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 not aware. There may be challenges or they, you know, they're you know. So the, um, I I think certainly in in the Caribbean region, I think that. Uh, m more meaningful participation and, and also um, uh, there's a there's a lot um, more need for advocacy and and and, and awareness and and, and as, uh, I think we one of the similarities with the Pacific that Jeremy mentioned uh, the awareness of what is the blue economy concept and even if persons have heard about it and they've heard certainly in Barbados a lot more persons would know about it since 2018 because of the ministry having it in its title but I think when you say this to, to like I have colleagues when I say this so they say oh this is for tourism or fisheries uh, and you're going to do things like um, you know uh, enhance the boardwalk so the boardwalk is an area um, in, in along the coast of Barbados. But, you know, so not understanding the whole, the, the, the totality of the concept. So maybe that's not only legal mechanisms. Great, and I, I believe Lorenzo had uh, something he wanted to, to say about this as well. Uh, yes, I guess I'll, uh, I'll flag Elisa's points first. She's been flagging them in the chat, uh, in the chat box. Um, uh, so in terms of the tools, um, we'll be talking about impact assessments, decision-making processes. There's also a, a vast body of experience with developing legal empowerment approaches to enable uh, coastal communities to actually make use of the processes that exist on paper so as to bridge the gap that often exists between the law 
and the practice. So you would often have a decent environmental legislation, but the problem is that it's, it's actually difficult to have it properly implemented. Uh, I guess the point I wanted to raise uh, myself, um, which is complementary to this, is that in addition to the specific tools, uh, um, there's also a question, I think, about the overall framing. Uh, and I think that's where uh, some of the reflections that Thierry, but also Jeremy uh, and Merle and several others were, were flagging uh, during the uh, discussion, is that we've got uh, tensions potentially between different interests of different imperatives, be it economic, commercial, social, and environmental. And, and, and in a sense, um, how decisions are going to be made and, and, the, and, and rather the uh, ultimate outcomes will be a function of um, the models of investment, the models of development that are pursued, what blue economy means in different contexts, the political processes for making decisions. But we think it also depends on how the law frames the issue, how the law protects different rights, how different interests are brought together in a legal context. And, and so I, I, I guess, in, uh, in, in the paper that Thierry and I worked uh, on, um, the argument there effectively is that the issue about foreign investment pouring in is not just about the impacts, the direct impacts of foreign investment per se, a large scale oil and gas installation, for example, those are very visible, but there are also slightly softer, more nuanced, harder to see impacts that are about what rights does the state have to take action to protect the environment, for example, if doing so can undermine um, business interests. So bringing in foreign investment, bringing in the private sector also brings in a set of commercial or uh, commercially oriented legal arrangements that would then have implications on how the social, the environmental, the economic issues are, are, are brought together. So I think it's important to talk about the tools, the practical tools that we can use to advance the issues, but we also need to think about the way in which the fundamental ways in which the, the law shapes the issues and the law shapes the prioritization of different interests, which are then reflected in the tools and are reflected in the, in the, in, in the, in the mediation between those different rights and interests. Thank you for that. Um, we, we, are, we are coming up to our two hour window, unfortunately. So um, I'm going to hand to Holly because I think she has um, just one of the questions that she'd like to answer from the chat. Well, um, I thought it was, it was perhaps a quite a nice way to close and see if people had any um, views um, on this. Now, I'm just recognizing there are other questions that perhaps we're not going to get to today, but um, that one of the questions was, um, how would you go about achieving an agreed definition with regards to all the different perspectives and experiences that were shared today? And um, I think, I don't know whether others would agree with me, but I think um, from my perspective, um, that there are agreement on, on a few areas, which is about um, participation and that sort of um, collective, um, envisioning that's required of, of, of the blue economy aims. But beyond that, um, and I, I think Jeremy perhaps mentioned, and I know he's mentioned before when I've spoken to him, that you know we need to sort of embrace the diversity and recognize that perhaps the blue economy is a different thing in, in and I'm, is a different thing in, in, in a, within each different context. Um, and um, I, th I think that would be my conclusion that perhaps consensus isn't isn't what we're looking for um, but i'd be interested to hear if anyone else um has any thoughts on that Jeremy? yeah i think i think the closer you get to the place the place-based type approach the more diverse and different that blue economy economy will be so it's, it's okay to talk about it in, in a global sense, but it applies to nowhere because everywhere has its characteristic, unique characteristics and things like that. And it's these multiple layers of blue economy going from the very sort of place-based person, because you know, people are important in this world and leaving no one behind and uh, is an important aspect of uh, 
Agenda 2030 and Sustainable Development Goals, and going up from, from those people that we're not trying to leave behind up into the rhetoric that we get at, at the global level through these regional dimensions, these we talked a bit about the Caribbean and the, and the Pacific here. You know, these are countries that work together within regions and have leverage as a region, which is beyond the leverage of each individual country. And within those regions, we have independent states, but we also have overseas territories and similar that have different uh, connections as well. But the regionality is important and then global. So I, I think that, uh, you know, blue economy is always going to be different, but it's important to pitch it at a particular level and consider those different dimensions at the level that we're looking at it. And I can think it will come increasingly diverse as we move from the global to the regional and regional down to, to countries and then into place-based contexts in, in villages or in mangroves or in, in lagoons. So it's, it's, it's a multi-level issue and I think that, that's difficult. It's going to be diverse. Thank and you. I think, Jeremy, that is a perfect point to end on. Uh, we have so many questions still, um, amazing amount of activity in the chat. What I would ask you to all do is after this event, a survey will be sent to you from the One Ocean Hub. Um, and if you have any burning questions or, or clarifications, put those in the feedback form um, and we'll try and get back to you. You can also follow the One Ocean Hub on the Twitter account. And there is also the website to keep up to date with uh, the activities as we as we progress through the next few years. So I would, I would just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for sharing your time with us, um, for taking part, and particularly for our panelists and our presenters for sharing their ideas and their presentations and um, gifting us with their insight for the discussion. So thank you very much. I'll give you a round of applause. And we close.